Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan Kamwasi from the National Conference of State Legislatures, and on behalf of NCSL, I would like to welcome all of you to today's webinar containing Medicaid costs, state strategies to fight Medicaid fraud and abuse. Today's webinar is the first in a two-part series on Medicaid. The next is on the next in the Medicaid series is on Medicaid managed care on April 20th. We are very fortunate to have three experts joining us on today's webinar. Patricia McTaggart of the George Washington University will open, followed by Mark Hennessy from the state of New York and Jack Stick from Texas. Our webinar today will conclude with a question and answer session. Please note that you will not be identified when you ask a question, nor can other participants see what you have typed. As a reminder, you may participate by clicking on the Q&A button and typing your question. We will also post the PowerPoint presentation on the NCSL website with an audio archive of the webinar. At this point, I am pleased to introduce our first speaker. Patricia McTaggart is currently a lead research scientist at the George Washington University, where she instructs graduate students in health information technology policy, quality, and state health policy. Ms. McTaggart has been a public servant for almost 30 years, including serving as Minnesota's Medicaid director and working for CMS. She provides technical assistance to states and federal agencies regarding health information technology, quality, Medicaid, and CHIP. And it is our pleasure to welcome her today. Please go ahead, Ms. McTaggart. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, I want to begin with kind of framing the whole discussion of containing Medicaid costs and different state strategies, because it's not just fighting Medicaid fraud and abuse. It's dealing with waste and payment errors. And if there's three things that you can remember throughout my presentation and as a walk away, I think the most important things is to remember everything is evolving. We are redefining health. We are transforming healthcare delivery. We are looking at new ways to look at payment methodologies. And because of that, we need to think as states and as state staff and act very differently. We have moved from just focusing on recovery and chasing but on preventative, and we need to do that through strate strategically predicting where the potential areas for fraud, abuse, and payment errors are, because in some of the cases, we're not going to be able to look just for deviations because the trends won't exist because the world is new. The second thing that I think is really important is we have become and need to become very data and health information technology dependent. The infrastructure is going to be critical as is the human resources with the right skill set. And then last but not least, failure to act is just not going to be an option. Uh, whether it's because of the mandates, the opportunities, the intentional fraud and abuse, or the non-intentional payment error, they all have cost implications at a time that the budgets demand that we be very conscious of where the money goes and how it goes. The first slide here deals with the Accountable Care Act. It provides a huge amount of additional opportunities, requirements, and resource demands. There are going to be new challenges and new opportunities because of this evolving environment. And as I said earlier, we need to deal with this by approaching and putting our emphasis on preventing as well as recovery. So what are some of the things that are included in the Accountable Care Act at certain levels for the state? Uh, there are new ways of looking at a new requirement that deal with provider participation. Um, we've had requirements before that dealt with Medicaid when Medicare terminated. But now if Medicaid terminates a provider be billing privileges because the provider has uh, broken some rules, they've exhausted all their appeal rights, or the timetable for their appeal has expired and there's no expectation that it's going to change and that it's a temporary revocation, Medicare may terminate, but this is really important, Medicare may terminate if Medicaid terminates, but Medicaid must terminate if Medicare does or the new thing or any other state Medicaid, which again makes a very important difference in understanding what is going on in other states. This, uh, the regulation also included CHIP as well as Medicaid. Uh, to do this, states will download information 
regarding the terminated providers, but they will also upload information regarding their own terminations, and that's been in place a little while. The second slide has to do with provider participation of trying to keep people out that don't belong in, which requires more screening. And to deal with the burdens of adding more screening requirements and the balance of seeking those, the federal government has actually put this into three levels. Everyone needs to be make sure that you make sure that they're either certified or licensed, if that's required in your state, and that they're eligible to meet the requirements of your particular state Medicaid or CHIP program. Um, because we have new data sources and new opportunities to look at national and state data, it's also required to look at very specific database checks to use the information that's available to the state. But for some provider populations, there is additional requirements to look at those that are more moderate or high risk. And those include things like unannounced or unscheduled site visits, criminal background checks, and even uh, fingerprinting. Those are tools for states to, in a sense, make sure that we have looked at the providers before they enter the Medicaid program. There are also tools through the Accountable Care Act for dealing with providers once they're in the program. There are also major requirements on the states and penalties or effects on states that if they don't follow the compliance requirements. And one of the most important ones or the most significant from a financial perspective, if a state for any reason fails to suspend a provider when there is a pending investigation of a credible allegation of fraud against either the individual or the entity, the Medicaid FFP is at risk. The Medicaid agency at the state will not be allowed to draw down the federal dollars when they fail to act. Now, to allow state flexibilities, the states are gonna be able to define credible allegation of fraud, and simple things like human error billings are not typically those things that le uh, rise to the level of fraud. I think the other important piece to remember this as we move to more managed care variations is managed care organizations are also subject to payment suspensions based on pending investigation. So it's not just the fee-for-service world, it is in the world of managed care as well, which has different implementation uh, effects on states as they make this real. The next slide deals with preventing inappropriate claims payment uh, tools and opportunities for the state, uh, including application fees, uh, tempor the ability for states to do a temporary moratoria. But I think the one that people have paid most attention to and is absolutely critical is the requirement for the physician or the nurse practitioner or certified nurse midwife, whoever is the appropriate uh, clinician, to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the patient prior to ordering the home health services, medical supplies, equipment, or appliances. Now, as we move to the world of electronic and telehealth, it is very clear that telehealth counts for a face-to-face -face encounter, but it's a critical concept in trying to avoid and making sure that the clinician in charge of the consumer is actually aware and authorizing the home health services, medical supplies, equipment, and appliances. Uh, in addition to that, another set of tools for the states uh, is the next slide. There are two opportunities, or requirements actually, that are ways for states to use tools to make sure they are seeking to prevent inappropriate claims payment, not necessarily fraud and abuse, but the one level down. And these are the recovery audit contractors, uh, often called the RACs, and their jobs are to audit payments to identify as well as recover payments that are overpayments or underpayments. And every state, your state included, was required to have a RAC program. Uh, one of the most controversial or dis points in discussion right now is the contingency fee requirement on how your state can pay the Medicaid RAC using contingency fees. And the federal regulation uh, register notice was just published in February, so this is fairly new to your state. One thing that is not so new, though, is the national coding, which basically affects your Medicaid information system 
that uh, provides standardized edits and definition of claim types that are subject to edits to basically make sure that we're editing, adjudicating claims for payment, that we put the right edits and audits in place to avoid inappropriate payments to the degree that is possible through looking at data. Um, in addition to those tools that the states have, the federal agency has also have some tools, and they're called the Medicaid Integrity Contract, or the MIC. They are contracted specifically and directly with CMS to review provider claims, and they actually have three different roles. There are three different MICs, and there's a reason they are separate. One sets do audits, one do reviews, and one do education. And clearly you want to have separate the role of educating providers and the MCOs, enrollees, and others from those that are actually doing the review of the provider claims. With all these new requirements, all of these new opportunities, and all these new tools, there is a need for resources at the state level. And it's not just more bodies, it's a different skill set because there is going to be more data. There are more uh, ability to look and use information technology to gain these new data sources and these new data tools. But it also means that at the state staff level, the staff need to have both analytical and clinical expertise in order to analyze the data more prospectively than retrospectively. In addition, we need to take full advantage of the data that is out there and transfer it into actionable information. And that is done by looking statewide enterprise, looking at your mental health agencies, your substance abuse treatment programs, your Medicaid and SHIP, as well as your state employees, your managed care and your fee-for-service, and looking across managed care and fee-for-service because the providers in your geographic location are serving not only Medicare and Medicaid, they are serving your state employees and public and private. So the more we can look and use information technology to look across the different data sources, and that requires interfaces not only across state agencies, but external to the state with Medicare, with other states, as I talked about earlier, with the public and private. And again, having databases that are not specific to a program, but look across programs so data can be analyzed at a person level and at the program level. It's also going to be important that we uh, use the tools that are available through information technology on that preventative end, including applications to screen claims, review of encounters, and looking at them differently because an encounter and a fee-for-service payment are not the same. And as a result of that, some of the tools used to do program integrity have to be adjusted. As the next slide shows, this really is a maze. It is a maze that's exciting, interesting, but means we have to look at things differently and make sure we're going the right pathways. As I said in a, in earlier, there are multiple new entities. For Medicaid, uh, it's accountable care organizations, but currently there are new state plan options for adjusting your primary care case management model to call the health home model for the developmentally uh, and physically disabled and aged. That requires looking at things different because it looks at bundling payments as well and I'm a mixed model of managed care concepts in a fee-for-service model, which is moving us not only to delivery system changes, but payment options. We have entered a whole new world of uh, self-directed care that we need to take a look at. And while Medicaid program is evolving, the marketplace, the medical world is evolving, and a whole new set of new technologies that are out there that need to be looked at, and new focuses. We, as we've moved with better technology, we have moved to um, not doing unnecessary surgeries, but doing a whole lot of more children imaging, which has not only clinical, but cost implications that need to be looked at. And as I said earlier, we're looking at new data and data sources, and not only the ability to look at the new data, but transforming it into information. So simultaneously to doing all these changes, we are having some realities going into places. We are moving in our coding, very basic information from ICD-9 to ICD-10, which means we want to look at it as a change of data, not necessarily a change of behavior or a program integrity issue. But it does affect the data, so it affects the program integrity. The next slide deals with how we can use some opportunities for health information technology or the new terminology, e-health, 
to help us do some preventing and not just recovery. And I think you can look up eHealth in both helping identify potential issues as well as communicating and managing the issues. Um, as we're looking for trends, we're going to have to look at it in a very analytical, prospectively, in what could happen because we're not going to have trends for health homes. We didn't have those before. We are going to have some conversion issues with ICD-10 coding that didn't exist before. We can leverage, though, or you can in your state, some of the tools that are already being created through your health information exchanges and in those states doing health insurance exchanges because whether it's in identification, communication, or management, privacy and security is privacy and security. We need to make sure that we're not only complying with HIPAA, that we're uh, identifying individuals. One of the major issues that has evolved through moving towards new means of care is identifying theft, uh, identity theft, uh, which is another aspect of uh, program integrity. Some of the ways we can leverage health information exchanges or insurance exchanges is every state is dealing with provider directories. Provider directories are not the directories that you have for a health plan for the network. It is the electronic address for all your providers. That can be a tool for you to communicate for, uh, through for your program integrity, but it's also a way to identify individuals better that are in your program. You can communicate because now your health information exchanges will have not only program directories um, to identify and a way to communicate to the providers, but it'll have secure messaging. So from a program integrity perspective, you can communicate with them differently. Uh, you will have a vehicle through your health information exchange to not have to have direct connectivity with every provider, but using the exchange to allow you to pull the data in and utilize that data more effectively. And then from a consumer perspective, one of the things we know we need to do is educate consumers better to be more engaged in their health care to improve the program integrity. And there's lots of ways of doing the web-based friendly uh, portals that are now being creative to allow you not only to access the data, but to also make it usable for consumers. Basically, again, we have a lot of new tools, a lot of new opportunities, and a lot of new requirements. We don't have enough time and energy to do this multiple times for the same thing. Get the data once, use it multiple times. Use it for operations as well as program integrity. Just think differently and operate differently and use the tools. And with that, I'm going to move to the two states that are actually doing this to tell you how it really can be implemented effectively and efficiently. Thank you very much, Patricia. As a reminder to our participants, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand side of your screen at any time during this presentation. Next, we will hear from Mark Hennessy. Mark joined the New York State Office of the Medicaid Inspector General as Assistant Inspector General for Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs in 2009. In this capacity, he oversees the office's efforts with its legislative and government agency partners, as well as supervising the county demonstration project a joint effort between his office and the New York counties to improve Medicaid integrity. Mr. Hennessy previously worked for the New York State Assembly as a legislative director for the chair of the Committee on Local Government. Please go ahead, Mr. Hennessy. Thanks for that, uh, for that warm welcome, and it's always nice to be uh, back talking to people who come from the very same place I did. Uh, had a, a number of years really enjoying working um, both as a legislative director and prior to that as a as a legislative analyst, senior analyst for many years uh, for the Committee on Investigations uh, here in New York. So um, as we move into talking about what we're doing here in New York, um, I wanted to just take a moment to, to really thank the previous presenter in, in giving that broad overview for uh, you know a lot of stuff that's happening here in the United States uh, today. Obviously, we've done a lot of work uh, reaching out to providers here in New York and managed care plans as well. Uh, to get a better understanding of how those changes will affect them. And um, as we move through this uh, today, this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we're seeing. So um, we begin every single one of our presentations with a little recap of the mission of, uh, you know, the program integrity mission in New York State. Our mission is to enhance the integrity of the New York State Medicaid program by preventing and detecting fraudulent, abusive, and wasteful practices in the program and recovering improperly expended Medicaid funds while promoting high-quality patient care. Now, I promised you all I will not read every slide as we go through, uh, but we always think it's really important to make sure that we step off on the same 
uh, stepping point as, uh, as you know, everything that we talk about here. And when we talk about our mission, one of the reasons why we don't say that it's um, – that it's just our, you know, the Medicaid Inspector General's Office's mission. It's also the mission of the broader program integrity uh, community that exists here in New York, which includes, uh, in some cases, the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit, which is a subunit of the Attorney General's Office here in New York, as well as uh, other people who are trying to improve integrity. There are compliance officers, special investigative units with the managed care plans, and a whole host of other entities that really are working very hard to improve uh, system integrity, program integrity, and make sure that uh, there is, is as little fraud and abuse in the system as possible. So achieving that mission uh, is only achieved through really, really great leadership. Um, here in New York, obviously, we have Governor Cuomo, who led an effort uh, probably about a year ago, year and a half ago, to do an overall redesign of the Medicaid program with the intent of trying to uh, reduce expenditures and also improve program integrity. Um, here in New York, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our Medicaid Inspector General in a minute, but uh, our office was very much so involved with the Medicaid redesign team and is leading some efforts uh, helping to contain costs within home health, which is a, you know, one of the areas here in New York that has seen, um, has seen pretty sizable increases in expenditures over the past couple of years. Uh, in working on program integrity, use a lot of cutting-edge data analysis and visualization tools. Uh, here in New York, again, we have um, very, very good data analysis activities. Uh, we're able, because of some of the technological project, or products that we use, to go all the way from the you know, $57 billion in total expenditures all the way down to individual services that were provided within a, a couple of clicks. Uh, we, we leverage those capabilities to really have an end-to-end -end understanding of what's going on within our state. We also uh, really want to emphasize some of the leading practices that we utilize, including transparency. Uh, one of the efforts we undertake is, is trying to make sure that all of our audit protocols are posted on our, our website. Um, we also uh, do a lot of work in, in compliance, which I know that is work that is also going on uh, now at the federal level, but New York was a vanguard in trying to uh, establish uh, compliance analysis activities and effectiveness reviews uh, to try to model that for other folks. And we've had that program in place for a number of years now uh, with some pretty amazing uh, and, and good results. Uh, obviously, I talked about data mining already, so I won't uh, talk about that too much more. We have a huge uh, investigative unit that is out in the field, on the street, um, looking for fraud every day. Uh, we have a, uh, a tremendous group that performs audits. Uh, a number of people who are working on cost savings activities like the home health project I was talking to you about later, as well as, um, you know, really trying to emphasize the importance of holistic subject matter analysis. Now, we will talk about that a little bit more a couple of slides in. I'll skip over the terrific staff, although obviously every, we, we really enjoy working with everyone here, and we have some amazing people who have a very intuitive ability to move through systems and take a look at them, analyze them, and figure out where uh, the fraud or abuse may exist. Uh, we also talk about an industry-leading practice, which is partnerships with the program integrity community in New York and beyond. We're very, very blessed uh, to have terrific working relationships, again, with the, the parties I talked about earlier, which is, you know, the Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Control Unit and, and other folks working at the state level. We have great relationships with the regulating agencies who come out with the rules and regulations that we review against. But we also have uh, a terrific, uh, terrific ability to work alongside some of our partners from the other states who are working on program integrity, as well as um, partners at the federal government. And uh, we've had terrific um, you know, participation from HHS OIG, which is where our current Medicaid Inspector General comes from, as well as other entities working at the uh, federal level. And, you know, obviously for the, the intent and purpose of talking about today, uh, that program integrity community uh, includes you. It, it, the truth is that as we talk a little bit about what we're seeing here in New York, uh, we hope that the lessons that we're learning uh, can be propagated across the other states. So taking that into account, um, here in New York, uh, one of the practices that we undertook was the creation of an independent Medicaid Inspector General's office. Uh, as I stated earlier, New York has a, 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 a pretty big Medicaid program, somewhere around $57 billion. And uh, so a few years back, uh, it was the intent of the state legislature and the governor uh, at the time to create our office. It was created in statute in uh, 2006. Uh, and it was set up as an independent office, which works, uh, which works as, star as part of the single state agency, but as an independent standalone office which reviews all sorts of work that is going on within the Medicaid program. Now, here in New York, the Medicaid program is split 
amongst a, a number of different regulating agencies. We have a Department of Health. We also have the Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, the Office of uh, Mental Health, and then the Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities. Now, our office uh, reviews all sorts of services uh, provided and regulated by those, uh, those agencies, uh, but it is uh, our office is an independent program uh, that really takes a very, very close look at everything that's going on. We have over 600 employees who are both here and out in the field, uh, and we have offices. Uh, New York State, for those uh, who aren't familiar with our state, is actually uh, a rather geographically large state, um, and we have offices stretching the entire uh, length of the state from Long Island, which is at our southern point, New York City, um, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, uh, and I almost skipped White Plains, so I, I apologize for that. The importance of that, though, is to make sure that we have very, very direct contact with communities uh, that we're overseeing and have a good sense of what is actually going on on the street. Uh, that has to be emphasized. Uh, here in New York, uh, we could have made a decision to go just with a New York office or just a Buffalo office or just an Albany office, but we thought it was important to have that ability for our people to actually go out in the field and not just be doing desk reviews as we've seen in some other places. So uh, our, our Medicaid Inspector General is a gentleman named James Cox. Uh, Jim comes from us from our friends in the federal government uh, at the HHS Office of the Inspector General. Two decades of Medicaid auditing experience. Uh, Jim uh, feels that the auditing process is a very, very vital part of how you review what's going on within the Medicaid program, and he's an auditor by trade. Um, you know, he spent those, those two decades working all across the United States, uh, especially in the western region of the United States, and then also uh, in the New York area and Puerto Rico as well. So we talked a little bit uh, earlier about how important it is to have a holistic approach to program integrity. Um, one of the things uh, that is an improvement that we're in, currently in the process of implementing is what we call a uh, business line team approach to program integrity. In uh, previous ways that we would do things, uh, we would have uh, each of our divisions uh, out there in the field looking at things uh, independently. And the way that we're trying to do it nowadays is to have all of our teams organized by the category of service. When I said business line team, category of service and business line team are basically the same approach. Each of those categories of service, those yellow bars that you see there, represents, uh, say, transportation or pharmacy or home health or one of the other areas of service that are out there. The intent there is to have an overall consistent application of the protocols and guidance. Again, our office uh, reviews people against the protocol and guidance. We do not actually uh, put together the rules that structure the Medicaid program. So we want to make sure that all of our folks who are working within those category of services business line teams have a proper understanding of what the protocols and guidance say. We want to make sure that all of our citations within our audit documents, our investigations are accurately cited. We want to make sure that in all that we do, we have a fair approach to program integrity. And we think that by organizing the work that we do and having all of those integrated multidisciplinary teams where you have data miners, uh, compliance agents, uh, auditors, um, quality assurance functions, investigations, all of those working together in these business line teams, we would expect um, as we have improved all the, all the other years that we've been in operation, a better result with this new uh, innovative approach. Now the thing is, one of the things that we have learned uh, a lot about over the past couple of years is that the Medicaid program uh, here in New York is a fairly complex undertaking. Uh, obviously with the size of the program that we have, uh, it is a, a, a program that has a number of, of component entities, all of which are linked in particular ways depending on the engagements. Here in New York, uh, we have our regulating agencies and law enforcement. We have uh, enrollees. We have providers, uh, provider associations, and managed care plans. And obviously, we have ourselves as well. Um, in different, at different times, in different capacities, we will, have, uh, we will have areas where we intersect with all of those organizations. Um, our role is to make sure that in all the things that we do, we're taking into account the different perspectives which may come to bear. Now, this is, this is as we talk about a normal auditing process and how that all lays out, the construction of uh, audit protocols, which if we're making suggestions to other states, one of the things that is a very, very good practice that we pursue here in New York is making sure that we have audit protocols in place before we go out in the field. Uh, there's two, you know, sort of 
fields of thought that exist as a, as it relates to that. Some people are of the opinion that you create the audit protocols as you're out in the field. Uh, some people think you do it before you go out in the field. Uh, we tend to come down on, on the view that you do it before you go out in the field, work with the regulating agencies, understand what the regulations have to say, uh, and then audit against them. Now, in an investigative setting, which we'll talk about, uh, one of the new types of investigations we're doing nowadays in a moment, um, you'll see that uh, it, it's very good to have a better understanding of what you're going to see before you go out there. Uh, it helps to temper your results and, and get better results. So how does New York fight fraud and abuse? Uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot to this point about auditing. Uh, that's obviously a mainstay of, of what we're doing here in New York. Uh, but we're also going to talk about some other, uh, some new implementations that we're undertaking. So, as we look at systems um, and our people go out and uh, spend time working with providers and understanding what's going on within the Medicaid program, we put a, a really strong value on learning about providers' business processes. So the thing is, if you go out and you know what the regulations and the the, the rules and the laws have to say, that that's a great starting point for understanding how a system works. What we want to do is go out and learn about the provider's business process so as we figure out how we're going to appropriately um, you know, take whatever actions we're going to take, all those things plug into how the business process works. Part of that is performing a root cause analysis. We have seen circumstances in the past where you can take a, a disallowance against an entity um, on the basis of, of uh, say, a, a missing item within a particular plan of care or, say, a, a prescription, for example, that didn't contain uh, the dosage or um, sometimes when someone will hit the same exception code over and over again. Uh, what we do here in New York at this point is make sure that we do a total traceback on how that all played out. So what we, wanted, what we want to see is when we see error rates um, that are similar across a number of different entities on a particular finding. So say, you know, in the case of, uh, in the case of a, a prescription, if we see that uh, the same field is missing across all fields, it may be an indication that there, the, the advice is, that's being given to the provider may not match up with what the regulations and the requirements uh, say. So we're going to trace that back to wherever it exists, and then we will work to correct the problem. So, you know, as it, it does continue to be about overpayments and collections and all that, it also, our work includes having that root cause analysis, which is going to help us to trace back and correct the problems where they exist. It's very, very important to not just identify a problem, but also figure out how you're going to get to that solution. Um, and again, with us, it, part of that process is reviewing the information that supports a claim. You know, we've seen a lot of cases in the past where we've gone in, looked at uh, the normal records that you would see, and it gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on in provider setting. But what we want to do these days is, is go a little further and, again, in line with that root cause analysis, get an, an indication whether there is other information which may support a claim or which may point us in the direction of why something happened in the first place. So here in New York, we also want to look at what matters. Uh, we want to really, really spend our time focusing on fraud. Um, here in New York, we've, we've done a very, very good job of fighting fraud and abuse over the past couple of years. As, as many people will tell you, we've recovered just in the past two years over uh, $1 billion in overpayments. Um, and a lot of that was done through work that looked principally at fraud and abuse. Um, we want to make sure that in everything that we're doing, we're looking for fraud, but we're also recapturing abuse. Um, but what we'll like to do is change the approach to improve integration of targeted data mining and risk analysis. So what that means is that in, in some places that we've looked at, some people focus solely on the high billers. Um, that's going to give you a good understanding of what's going on with a very, very large organization, but it may not give you an understanding of what is happening with the mid-size or the smaller size. And what we have seen in some communities um, across New York is that when people are committing fraud, they may have a good sense of how to stay just above the radar or just below the radar, sorry. Uh, and so what we try to do is make sure that that targeted data mining and risk analysis contains several stanchions w by which we can understand whether we should be targeting other folks that we haven't looked at in the past. What we also need to do here in New York, because the way that our, our statute is structured, and also because we care about quality of care, is balance whatever approach we're taking with maintaining access to services. Uh, you know, we, Jim Cox, who's the Medicaid Inspector General, and we here in New York, 
think it's really important uh, that the Medicaid program exists to help people in their times of need. And we want to make sure that um, as we're taking action, we're not unintentionally uh, destroying a system of care when there are other possible ways that you can mitigate some of the risks. Now, in late uh, 2011, our office decided that we were going to undertake what are called inventory verification reviews. This is where um, you go in, you take a look at, uh, in a pharmacy setting, how much of a particular pharmaceutical uh, was billed to the Medicaid program, uh, and then you ask for a list of the wholesalers uh, for the pharmacy. So that's, that's the people who the pharmacy actually buys the drugs before they dispense them uh, to people who come up to the counter. Um, you go, you get that list of wholesalers, and then you go to the wholesalers and you ask the question, how much, uh, how much of that pharmaceutical did that pharmacy buy? Um, in cases where you see that the amount purchased from the wholesaler is actually smaller than what was billed to the Medicaid program, you know that there is a, there's a pretty big problem. Um, what we've seen is that in New York, uh, we've done a, a number of these reviews. Uh, we have a team that is led by a pharmacist investigator. That's uh, someone who actually has a degree and a license to practice pharmacy. Um, and uh, that team, headed up by that pharmacist investigator, is in charge of analyzing results. The data miners then compare and they calculate those variances, what I talked about before, that, that difference between you know, part, you know, the first step and the second step. And then if the variance is significant, uh, we understand that there really can only be two reasons for those variants, at least as, as we've seen thus far. One is that uh, there may be phantom billing going on, and then the other, more concerning, uh, is that uh, someone is actually buying uh, the pharmaceuticals off the street and reselling them. What we've seen here in New York uh, is that in the seven reviews we've done thus far, uh, in the, and in the one final action we concluded, uh, that really when you focus on that fast action, uh, you're going to be able to really uh, take a look at the bad actors, and in the case of what we did, uh, our first review took four months to complete versus about uh, two years, which uh, when you put a value on tackling those, those bad actors as fast as you can, uh, four months is a, a pretty remarkable turnaround. One thing I want to also temper expectations for the people who are working in the legislature, I just want to let you understand, I mean, part of the reason why it took four months to do this process here in New York is that we have a, a very good um, structured process for undertaking these kinds of reviews and reporting results and all that. And um, in utilizing that process, uh, that just that process itself takes about two and a half months. So the real work of this took about a month and a half to conclude. Now, again, uh, we've seen audit processes that are similar that can take, you know, sometimes years. Uh, so from our perspective, four months is, is a pretty fast undertaking. And uh, in, the, in this one case, the, the one that uh, we concluded recently with a final action, uh, we found three, uh, three pharmacists who uh, we took an exclusion action against, so they will no longer be participating in the Medicaid program. And we also found in just a review of 10 drugs that were being sold by the pharmacy, there was almost a half million dollars in recovery from one, one pharmacy. Uh, the thing is that there were dozens of other drugs which were also being uh, sold by that pharmacy. And, uh, you know, we will do an all, uh, you know, end-to-end -end review to see what the interlinking is between the, uh, between the pharmacists and some of the recipients and all that kind of work. So as we talked about that root cause analysis earlier, uh, we'll do a little trace back uh, to make sure that we understand the totality of what happened in this case. The, the, the yield, the end result, is obviously better program integrity. But uh, from our perspective as well, it's not just better program integrity. It's also that uh, we want to make sure that that action is taken as quickly as possible. Again, here in New York, uh, what we're really focusing on is fighting fraud, uh, improving integrity through a cooperative approach, and saving taxpayer dollars. Uh, we accomplish that by making sure that uh, we're moving as fast as we can against the fraudulent actors, and then also knowing what we're doing before we go out on the field. Uh, I can't stress that enough to folks how important that is. Um, and so I wanted to thank you all uh, for having us here today and for giving us a chance to talk about what we're doing here in New York. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, now we'll hear from our third and final speaker. Jack Stick is currently Deputy Inspector General of Enforcement in the Texas Office of the Medicaid Inspector General. In this position, he supervises the investigators, analysts, 
medical professionals and administrators who conduct the state's Medicaid waste, fraud, and abuse investigations. Mr. Sick is a graduate of the University of Michigan School of Law and a former special counsel to the governor of Nebraska. He has a decade of experience as a prosecutor at both the state and federal levels and served as a member of the Texas House of Representatives. Prior to his current position, Mr. Sick was appointed a municipal judge in Travis County, where he served for two years. Please go ahead, Mr. Sick. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it's almost uh, as good as if I'd, I'd written it myself. Um, and uh, I want to, um, I guess I think I want to start by telling you that I approached uh, this job uh, drawing on my experience as a, as a prosecutor before I, I took this job. Uh, I was a, a state and, and federal prosecutor and um, really applied a lot of the uh, experience that I had from those jobs to what we were doing here. Uh, this, this office, uh, the Office of Inspector General, was created in 2003 uh, when I was in the legislature, um, and uh, it was part of a massive overhaul uh, of the Texas Health and Human Service uh, Services system. We created an entity called the Health and Human Services Commission, which has about 55,000 employees and uh, 40, 45 billion dollars in expenditures. A good chunk of that, obviously, is um, uh, is, is Medicaid. Um, in the uh, uh, in the legislation, the uh, inspector general himself is uh, an employee of the governor. Um, the agency, uh, the inspector general's office, is attached administratively uh, to the Health and Human Services Commission. Uh, so we've got independence in, in our approach um, and the freedom to do what we need, but we've still got the support that the, uh, the enterprise itself can, can provide. Uh, the office of inspector general has about 650, 660 people in it divided primarily into two divisions. My division is the enforcement division where we conduct uh, investigations and initiate the enforcement actions. We also have, uh, let me back up, that that division has about 330 to 340 people in it. We have a uh, uh, audit division which has about 200, 230 people in it. Then the rest is divided uh, among our sanctions division uh, which are the attorneys who actually litigate uh, cases for us. Uh, and then our operations division. Um, we have offices scattered across the state. Like, uh, like New York, we're a fairly good-sized state. Uh, we have more offices than, than I can remember. Um, and the reason we've approached it that way rather than a centralized approach is that we believe that it's important to, to do two things. One is to have a visible physical presence uh, as a deterrent, if nothing else. And then secondly, we think it's important uh, to have a presence close to um, close to where the practitioners and the providers are located. We think it's important that they have access to us and that we can have uh, access uh, to them quickly. All right, with that being said, um, about June of last year, um, we did a top to bottom review of, of the Office of Inspector General. And we determined at least um, in, in this division, the enforcement division, um, we were a little bit lopsided. We've got our division divided into both provider uh, investigations and recipient investigations. And uh, the overwhelming majority of, of the staff resources and financial resources were dedicated uh, to recipient investigations. And of course, that's just not really where the money is. So we made a conscious decision that we were going to reevaluate our priorities and that we were gonna go where the money is. We doubled our investigative manpower in the uh, Medicaid Provider Integrity Division um, and divided ourselves into regional teams uh, where we have people who are physically out in the field, so teams of seven to nine people uh, located in, in different cities with backup support uh, here in Austin uh, provided by uh, medical professionals, so doctor, nurses, uh, expert witnesses, that kind of thing. Um, and what we decided to do was have each of the regional teams have a field uh, expert. So we've got uh, various initiatives that we're doing at any one time. Um, we have orthodontic initiatives, hearing aid initiatives, durable medical equipment. What we did was we took one person in each of those team, each of those regional teams and made them an expert in that field so that they could teach the other ones and act as a resource to the other investigators who were in that field. They also uh, work closely with other experts in their in their area. So a hearing aid expert in 
uh, in Dallas would work closely with the hearing aid experts in, in Houston and San Antonio and Corpus. Um, and that allows us to uh, rapidly respond to any problems that we see and deploy a team of people to any, any area of the state uh, within a matter of a day or two if we need to, to conduct um, urgent investigations. Um, we have uh, adopted an aggressive approach to credible allegations of fraud. We now will place a credible allegation of fraud hold on a payment, uh, I'm sorry, on a vendor uh, at the intake phase. Normally, um, we would wait until we'd really gotten into a case and conducted a good chunk of a full-scale investigation before make, making a fraud determination. We stopped doing that. We Moving that credible allegation of fraud determination earlier in the process has enabled us to stanch the flow of, of money to a bad provider, and it increases the amount of uh, uh, our recoveries. It also uh, gets us a lot closer to, uh, uh, to, to real-time um, fraud interdiction as opposed to the pay and chase method. So what we did uh, was we decided that we were going to be um, as efficient as we possibly could in conducting our investigations. Um, and to do that, we decided we would initiate a series of um, really directed, directed missions uh, in areas where we determined that there might be a substantial likelihood of fraud. So in Texas, we've had problems with uh, orthodontists uh, and dentists abusing the system. So we, uh, we identified uh, the top 50 utilizers, identified about $400 million in overpayments, and conducted uh, a series, actually we're in the middle of conducting a a series of investigations um, on on those providers. What we did um, is assign a team of investigators, uh, as I indicated, to handle all of the cases uh, in a particular initiative area. So I've got the same investigators doing the same kinds of cases over and over again. The first case generally is a, lear is a learning process. It's slower, uh, you work out the bugs, and uh, you know it takes a while. Uh, but by the third or fourth case for each investigator, it's it's routine. They've got the the template down for the investigative report. They've got re relationships established with the expert witnesses they need to use. Um, and we are able to increase significantly, as you'll see in a second, um, our speed, our accuracy, um, and the effectiveness uh, of our investigative teams. So our, investigated, our investigations, um, our, in our completion rate increased by about 25%. That's a real conservative number because uh, we're still about nine months uh, into the year, so we won't know uh, till the end of the year exactly where it ends up. But my guess is we'll, we'll end up completing about 50% more cases this fiscal year than we did last fiscal year. But if you look at the next bullet point there, um, if you measure our productivity by dollars, we increased our productivity by 1,700%, um, or we will have by the end of this fiscal year, 1,700%, which is really just staggering. And by doing that, or to do that, we, we really just made – some basic procedural and, and process changes in how we, how we uh, took a look at cases. One of the most significant things that we did was we dropped our investigative time from uh, 42 months when I got here um, to about eight weeks today. Um, uh, and that, I think that one thing alone has probably done more to increase our recoveries, more to increase our identified lost dollars than, than any other single thing that we're doing. Durable medical equipment. I don't know how it is in other states, but in Texas, if, if you open a DME, it almost is um, it's sort of a neon light saying, investigate me for fraud. We have 5,800 uh, durable medical equipment providers here, and our investigative approach here was just to say, look, let's, let's take 300 investigators and do a statewide sweep, and let's just see, you know, is there anybody here? Is this an open field? Uh, is it a pool, um, or is it a legitimate ongoing business concern? Um, the ACA requires that we visit, as you know, um, most, of, uh, uh, most of our providers, and so we were going to have to go out to the DMEs anyway. Um, so this is, an this is an initiative that will begin uh, here in a couple of weeks, and um, initially it, it appears that we'll probably be able to take out about 2,000 providers by doing that. Each one of those um, you know, is, is billing the state, some to a greater degree than others, some some. You know, very little, but it's it's still all illegitimate billing. In uh, March 1st of this year, the state of Texas switched to a managed care organization approach to providing Medicaid services. 
and that was the, really the uh, the genesis of our top to bottom review of the Inspector General's office. About 80% of the state dollars is going to will be going through managed care, um, and and many people said, well, if you got managed care, what does what does OIG really need to do? I mean, it's it's their money. Let them investigate it. And that was not our approach, obviously. Um, we believe that we still have the same obligations to uh, to manage the state's money carefully, but in addition to that, we still have to look at the managed care entities themselves for primarily for underutilization. What we did was rather than developing an antagonistic uh, relationship with EMCOs, we have tried to do everything that we can to uh, be cooperative with them. We view their special investigative units. Um, really as, as, as offshoots uh, of our unit uh, here in, in the Inspector General's office. They give us leads. They can do a lot of the investigations. In fact, the law provides uh, them authority to investigate cases below $100,000 unless we intervene and take them over. Um, doing the, uh, uh, the cooperative approach has really uh, allowed us to branch out and, and find different, different ways to to expedite investigations and the exchange of information, even simple things like establishing an FTP site so they can upload their data to us quickly uh, has provided uh, opportunities for us to cooperate with them. The other thing that we're doing is we're providing regular alerts to to our, uh, our MCOs. A uh, physician uh, bad in one plan is bad in all the plans. It's not like they figure out how to cheat one and, and decide it's not a good idea to cheat all the others. Uh, and so we provide them with, with that kind of um, uh, update and reporting, and we find that 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 actually has been a real successful uh, approach. Um, but what I really wanted to talk with you about today, in addition to these procedural changes, uh, is something that that we're uh, on the verge of of uh, implementing in Texas. We're very close to making some final decisions on on how we want to proceed in this. But that's graph pattern analysis, which is sort of the the next line beyond predictive analytics and and data mining. And we find that we've got a tremendous amount of data, a tremendous number of providers, and a tremendous amount of transactions going on. And it's just too difficult to, to really see uh, patterns that exist in that kind of, uh, that kind of data, that amount of um, uh, transactions. There is technology available that allows you to crawl through uh, just mind-boggling amounts of data to identify suspicious activity, actually to identify whatever you want to identify, but of course in this case um, to identify suspicious behavior. Um, there's really no limit to the number of data sources or amount of data that you can use. In fact, it works better with more data. Um, and so I created a, an example here of uh, electronic benefits trafficking, but of course the, the implications on, on Medicaid provider integrity is uh, is manifold as well. Basically what it does is it says um, we know that there are relationships that exist uh, between events. When you've got somebody who is uh, uh, selling a, uh, an EBT card to a particular retailer, that's probably not the only time that transaction has happened. So what we do is we use graph pattern analysis to, um, to find relationships between um, providers uh, and transactions, between transactions and individuals, between addresses, dates, times, everything that you would want in order to uh, conduct an investigation can be handled through graph pattern analysis. The reason it's called graph pattern analysis is because it uh, creates charts for you to use. So it allows you to see in, in um, Visualize, or to visualize on a computer in front of you um, exactly what's going on in a, in a particular transaction. So you can see where something starts, where it goes, um, the relationship between people uh, involved. Um, trying to get to the right screen here. There we go. Um, so you can see uh, rapidly, or an investigator sitting at a desktop, and this is a desktop application, can come into work on Monday morning, sit down with a cup of coffee, and pull up data and begin to play with them. What's the relationship between uh, um, what's the relationship between the owner on the on the far left um, and uh, so we'll say this guy and um, this this market here. How do they uh, how do they interact with each other? And as you begin to play with the data and as you begin to explore the relationships, you can see that. Different places are um, uh, are connected to each other, and 
then you can see how they're connected to each other. And that tells you exactly where you need to begin focusing your resources. Uh, this is probably worth, um, this program is probably worth about two investigators. Um, so it really doubles the, the power of your investigators. Um, and you can see how it graphically describes um, what, you, what you're looking for. So when you begin to see these, these chrysanthemum patterns here, you see that there's a pattern that exists and you know um, where to focus your investigative efforts. Um, graph pattern analysis is really the, uh, the next uh, line of, uh, of defense for this office for uh, the Inspector General's office, and it's really the one thing that's going to be able to give us near real-time, um, uh, near real-time ability to interdict waste, fraud, and abuse. Particularly as we begin to enter relationships with other states to share data. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to do is uh, um, show that slide. Um, I was a Michigan grad, and I figure any opportunity to put a Wolverine up is a good one. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you, um, and I'm glad to answer uh, any questions that y'all have. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, I would like to thank all three of our wonderful speakers, Patricia McTaggart, Mark Hennessy, and Jack Stick. And now we'd like to open the floor for participant questions and answers. As a quick reminder, to ask a question, please quick, click on the Q&A button and type in your question. The first question is directed to Mr. Hennessy. You noted that most of your office's work focuses on providers. Do any in uh, investigative work, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry, does your organization do any investigative work with member fraud? And if so, how much of your focus is on this group? Yeah, and I, I, this is Mark Hennessy. So uh, we do do, uh, uh, and if I left people with the impression that we didn't do a lot of, uh, you know, what we call uh, member or enrollee work, we do do a tremendous amount. Uh, and, it, you know, somewhere in the area of it's about a 50% uh, provider versus recipient uh, investigative work balance um, that that work um, has you know, very similar rates of success uh, here in New York the way that our program is structured we work very closely uh, with people working at the county level who actually manage um, enrollment and and different matters like that and uh, we have very a very active practice that's looking at enrollee slash member issues Thank you. And the next question is to all of our panelists. Let's start with Jack and then go to Mark and Patricia. What is your advice to states working with managed care organizations to ensure that they are aggressively reducing fraud and abuse? Jack, are you there? Uh, Jack's line has uh, disconnected. We'll try to go ahead and uh, get it connected. Well, should I jump in? It's it's Mark Hennessy. That would be great. Okay, so uh, you know, I think Jack actually kind of touched on this as he was moving through his presentation, and I, I would totally agree with what he brought up, which is that it's very, very important to have um, a working relationship with the managed care organizations. And as Jack stated, you know, they have their special investigative units, which uh, we also in New York do work very, very closely with um, and see them as, as really partners in the program integrity mission that we all carry out. Uh, so the one piece of advice that we would suggest is wherever possible, try to find a way uh, that you can work alongside the managed care plans because the truth is that if you talk with a lot of these people, and we have obviously huge opportunities to do so, a lot of the conversation is about how can we really tighten up controls, how can we tighten up process, and how can we achieve program integrity. Now, having said that, uh, it's also important uh, to have uh, reviews going on of managed care plans and, and how they work through issues. And, you know, to have an overall understanding of what the requirements are of your managed care plan and then also to work, as we do here in New York, with the regulating agencies to understand whatever relationships may exist between both the regulating agencies and the managed care plans and then also uh, between the managed care plans and their individual service providers. And this uh, is Patricia. What I, yeah, this is Patricia. What I would add to that is, again, to uh, thank preventive versus post. 
which is your relationship with your managed care plans is a contractual relationship. Mm -hmm. So what you have in your contracts with them and they have with their contracts with the providers is absolutely crucial for effective use. Um, so I think it's important that you deal with the fact that you do not get FFP if um, someone's been identified and they still are getting paid. So you need to make sure that's dealt with in your contract. You also need to make sure that all federal requirements are dealt with in your managed care contract, including those related to program integrity. And then you make contract requirements that deal with, uh, as well as operationalizing a partnership that makes it when there is something found that you are able to work together so the transfer of information and data is an allowable thing. Um, so I think you need to deal with it from all those perspectives. Thank you. And at this point, I think we are out of time uh, to finish up questions and answers. However, I know many of you have additional questions. As you can see on the screen, my contact information, Megan Kumlossi at ncsl.org. Go ahead and email me any questions you have and we'll make sure we get you uh, an answer. Again, I'd like to thank today's speakers and all the attendees for their time and participation in today's conference. Please be sure to give us feedback on this webinar by filling out the survey that will appear on your screen when you close out of the webinar. We really appreciate your input. And as the final reminder, this webinar is the first in a two-part series on Medicaid. Please sign up for the next one on NCSL's website. Thank you very much.